Chapter 22 Process Theology But for the grace of God, one would have to say that mankind is afflicted with a terminal case of idiocy. It all goes back to Adam. There he was in paradise, standing next to a naked lady Eve, and all he does is to munch an apple or whatever that piece of fruit was. Of course, Eve was no better. The first person she met with a smooth and promising offer led her astray. She was ready to listen to anyone except God and her husband. Things have not improved since then. Breaking norms is a popular goal. What we get, for example, in the world of painting are, quote, schools, end quote, like pop art, then op art, and so on. The world of scholarship is no better. We get slightly revised versions of old myths as soon as they are negated, and the newer schools of thoughts are essentially versions of the old follies. Idiocies become us. In the town of Arcata in Northern California, feminists in 1993 organized a bare-breasted parade under the slogan, quote, Free your breast and your mind will follow. End quote. Minds like that are better not freed. Process theology is one step in the long development of theological modernism. It is the counterpart on the modernist side to what theistic evolution is on the evangelical side. Many evangelicals, eager to be in tune with science while maintaining a biblical facade, insist on the validity of evolution with God guiding it in the background. By this means they hope to be scientifically acceptable while maintaining their evangelical status. It is, of course, an untenable position because it seeks to unite two mutually exclusive premises. Evolution's premise is chance, not God. Process theology seeks to retain the form of biblical faith while seeing the whole reality governed by the evolutionary process. Two key figures in process theology have been Alfred North Whitehead and Pierre Daillard de Chardin. A third can be added, Charles Hartstone, in many respects the ablest man. Although very different from Karl Marx, he shared a common goal, to retain the form of Christian theism while giving it a different nature. With Bart, the facade was biblical Christianity as against modernism. With Hartshorn, it was theism rather than atheism. In Beyond Humanism, Essays in the New Philosophy of Nature, 1937, dedicated to William James and Charles S. Pierce, Hartshorn was critical of humanism. An able thinker, Hartstone was not unfair in his critique of humanism, stating, quote, Humanism is not so much atheism as a reinterpretation of God, not so much a religion as an attempt to separate the sound human kernel of religion from its supernatural husks. It is the faith of humanists that the essential values of religion are independent of these husks. Thus Calverton speaks of, quote, superior substitutes for religion and the gods, end quote, end quote. If religion is to be separated, quote, from its supernatural husks, end quote, what remains will not be Christianity nor historic theism. Hartsthorne, in fact, is equally negative towards Christianity and humanism. Quote, Supernaturalism and humanism are, I hold, two aspects of the same error, the mistaken notion that nature, in her non-human portions and character, is wholly subhuman. End quote. Is there a third possibility, that nature in some transcendent aspect is God? This is the alternative Hartsthorne is concerned with. It does not occur to him to question the existence of nature. Does nature exist, or is the term simply a collective noun for the sum total of the created order? It is easy to say that things naturally exist, but does this mean that there is such an entity, intellect, mind, purpose or direction that can be called nature? For Hartsthorne, fundamentalism does religion a disservice because it is, in its view of infallibility, quote, a meaningless idea, end quote, or quote, a positive evil, end quote. His own view is better, he holds, quote, for just as God is nature, as infinitely lovable, 
so he is nature as infinitely intelligible. End quote. Nature as lovely and intelligible is a strange notion, and its key ideas are borrowed from the biblical God. While holding to these ideas, Hartsthorne rejected the idea that God is, quote, externally issuing commands like a benevolent tyrant, end quote. Hartsthorne's God must be totally intelligible, but never capable of an act or a command. He is simply, quote, the hidden, but always more or less dimly felt life of nature, end quote. Page 27, a very safe God indeed, one who can never threaten man's position or stand. Such a God, Hartsthorne can love easily, because he is never a threat nor a judge. He has, in fact, nothing to say. Hartsthorne recognises that the biblical God does impose restraints on immoral behaviour and a clear criterion of good and evil is needed. But for Hartsthorne, supernaturalism has a meagre and tyrannical vision of being, and humanism is no better. According to Hartsthorne, quote, If God is simply, quote, beyond, end quote, or outside of nature, then we know nothing of him and the very word God is meaningless. Similarly, with chance or the relation between actuality and unrealized possibilities, what, quote, may be, end quote, but is not, cannot be withheld from actuality by any, quote, inviolable, end quote, and eternal laws, for then it would not really be a maybe. We must find room for open alternatives within nature, just as we must, if we are to be theists, find room for God there, end quote. The presuppositions of this statement are revealing. God cannot, for Hartsorn, be outside of or beyond nature, because that would supposedly render God meaningless. He must be a part of the natural process, apparently. A supernatural God is meaningless because what is beyond nature cannot speak or give a revelation to those within nature, because Hartsorn's presupposition is that nothing can exist outside nature, let alone speak. His dogmatism rules out the God of Scripture. For him, there can be nothing real outside the evolutionary process. His concern is essentially to rule out naturalistic determinism. His, quote, God, end quote, gives a certain freedom to the process to rescue it from a mechanistic and meaningless change. He is more interested in rescuing freedom for the mind than locating, quote, good, end quote, as a person. He wants an organic rather than a mechanistic natural process. Thus, for him, reducing mind and matter is essential. Lynn Harold Howe observed of Hartsthorne's thesis, quote, Dr. Hartsthorne believes that the quantum mechanics has made possible a new synthesis in terms of the panpsychism, and he looks to Alfred North Whitehead as a particularly successful pioneer of the field. To put the result in a sentence, quote, The new view consists of such a conception of God and such a conception of nature that the two coincide. God is, according to the new theism, simply nature as literally and profoundly lovable and not merely as pleasant to our senses or interesting for us to think about. Dr. Hartsthorne urges that we accept a theistic naturalism, understanding nature itself to be divine. The world is a world of body-mind. Quote, we shall never understand a God of love unless we conceive him as the all-sensitive mind of the world body. End quote. Quote, the new theism can perfectly well state its thesis as, quote, the universe is divine, end quote. That is, is the supremely integrated conscious organism, end quote. Hartsthorne's God is not much of a God. We, he tells us, know that he is, not what he is. When Hartsorn tries to discuss the, quote, personality, end quote, of his God, his righteousness or his purposes, he drifts into obscurantism. He wants a God who can evoke something resembling what the God of Scripture does, but without becoming that God. In The Gay Science, Nietzsche said something most relevant to our subject, quote, without Hegel, there could be no Darwin, end quote. Without Hegel, there could be no Hartsthorne either. 
Very early American Hegelians give to process an infallibility and inerrancy of amazing character. Thus, Octavius Brooks Frothingham, 1822-1895, a Harvard man, a Unitarian, and a leader in the new thought of his time, wrote, quote, The interior spirit of any age is a spirit of God, and no faith can be living that has that spirit against it. No church can be strong except that alliance. The life of the time appoints the creed of the time and modifies the establishment of the time. End quote. This defecation of process, whether in Hegel, Marx, Frothingham or Hartthorne, may see itself as noble and wise, but it is a blueprint for tyranny. Tyranny, moreover, is called by a variety of names from the inevitable historical or dialectical process to history or by the term God. In every case, however, well-meaning, the implicit gospel of this new God is a totalitarian order against which no man has a moral right to object or argue. Quote, the life of the time appoints the creed of the time, end quote, end quote. No faith can be living that has that spirit against it, end quote. In other words, there can be no morally grounded or valid stand against the reigning tyranny that expresses, quote, the interior spirit, end quote, of that age. Nietzsche held, quote, morality is herd instinct in the individual, end quote. At the same time, he reduced consciousness to something that, quote, does not really belong to man's individual existence, but rather to his social or herd nature, end quote. Process theology implicitly eliminates both God and man, W. Norman Pittinger called Hartsthorne's version of process theology, quote, a natural theology, end quote. Process theology is inevitably that because it allows no word to speak or to govern other than a totally natural word. As a result, process theology spokesmen can give no word other than their own because none other, least of all God, are allowed to speak. <laughs>